Um, but then as it moves, uh, it kind of traces, like all, all balloons, it sort of traces these kind of internal surfaces of the air because of the way it has to follow <coughs> the surfaces of equal pressure, uh, unlike um, you know, fossil fuel driven um, uh, airplanes and so on. It has to go with the air, it drifts. It, 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 and uh, for, if any of you have been in a hot air balloon and had that sort of experience, it's this very strange feeling of stillness as it's moving uh, because you're moving with the air and you can see the trees on the ground shaking in the wind and you feel no wind at all. Um, but this solar balloon also um, has this uh, intense relationship with the sun because, of course, if a cloud goes over the sun, it, it falls down. So it has this kind of uh, sense of it, it, unlike a sort of helium balloon which sort of charges along uh, forever uh, along these surfaces, this balloon sort of dives and, and, and has to swim through these different surfaces as it um, loses and gains heat. Um, so this is a kind of different way of thinking, I suppose, about the different forms of movement that the Earth has made possible. So we have the, uh, this atmosphere which has this very complex structure produced both by the gravity of the Earth piling up the, the air so the air gets thinner and colder and uh, drier as it goes up and everything, but also by the constant flow of, um, of, uh, of energy that comes from the outside, uh, which then has to be dissipated. The temperature difference between the, the equator and the poles has to be dissipated thermodynamically. Um, so it produces these uh, diff rolling, uh, overturning cells and trade winds and everything. Uh, and so th th there are ways that you know, we can imagine forms of technology, if you like, which have this way of both of revealing the internal mobilities of the Earth, of the different parts of the Earth, uh, and sort of going with them uh, in ways which are very different, I think, from the sort of uh, fossil fuel mentality. So that's a kind of different way to sort of make visible some of the ways I'm thinking about this through kind of practical experiments with, uh, in, in terms of the different forms of mobility. But I suppose, and this is where, I, uh, this, this talk is going to sort of dribble out into uh, incoherence at the end, like many of my talks, I suppose, but uh, um, just to kind of give you some of the, you know, to, 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 to uh, maximise the chances of having useful five-minute discussion at the end, I suppose some of the things I'm thinking about, uh, uh, okay, no, what I'll do is I'll sort of jump to the end. I suppose what I'm saying is, um, I think... Uh, spending our knowledge of the human technological world and of contemporary mobilities of the Anthropocene or whatever, suspending them temporarily and thinking, okay, what are the different forms of movement that there are that have developed within this complex body and assemblage known as the Earth with all these s strange folds and uh, different forms of um, in what I call inhood or of um, things being inside other things. Uh, what different forms of mobility and movement and motion have they developed? So this is a kind of a typical blocky diagram of the Earth system, and we've got the, the Earth's, you know, the sort of lithic bit down here, the core mantle, upper mantle, and crust and everything. And then we've got the atmosphere and the biosphere and the oceans and, the, uh, and, and so on, and then the bottom of the oceans. So we can think about the different forms of, of mobility and movement there are within these uh, media, particularly the fluid media of the atmosphere and the oceans and the biosphere, we call that a fluid media, uh, but also these are fluid media down here. Um, and we can think about these different forms of movement that have developed. And of course, what kinds of things, we t what kind of movement depends on what kind of things have evolved, you know, when we think about rocks moving, um, you know, we're thinking, talking about different forms of solidity and different kinds of existence that, uh, that have emerged and move in different kinds of, well, a sense, you know, the different kind of sense of what it is for something to move. And, and clearly, when we get into the biosphere and we think about movement, we can think about, you know, vi vi the way virus spread, you know, the way viruses spread or the way that bio the invasive species spread. And there's different kinds of way forms of movement which might not be exactly the same uh, as when we're talking about single objects moving. We're talking about the movement of uh, bio um, genetic information and so on. But then we can also talk about movements between these different things, you know, between the atmosphere 
and the biosphere, obviously, you know, thinking about climate change and the, and the technosphere we could add to this, but also um, the sort of fluxes of energy and um, carbon and uh, other kinds of um, substances, materials, between all these different parts of the earth. And we can also think about how these were, these are driven by the energetics of the sun. So this di in this diagram, the kind of dark arrows are this kind of cascading, uh, you can't quite see these different parts of the earth here, that here, they're too faint, but the sort of, the way the en energy of the earth causes these differences in heating and cooling, which causes temperature gradients, which causes the motion of the, earth, of the atmosphere and the water, which transports heat around, which moves the water around the earth, which moves these geochemical cycling of different elements and so on, and biotic activity. But then the way um, causation comes back up the chain, if you like, you know, with, bi with, you know, with Lovelock's ideas about how biotic activity is actually shaping these other processes going back up to the... Um, to the loss of energy from the earth. So we could think about how, you know, the energetic, the role of different forms of energy in producing these different kinds of motion uh, within the parts of the earth. But we could also think over time, this is a terrible diagram, but sitting there I couldn't find a better one. Uh, I mean, one way to think about the, what's happened over the earth's uh, four and a half billion year history is it's gone ver through various sort of key what are called major transitions in this concept of Maynard Smith and uh, Shathmari, um, that there are there have been these po moments in the earth where the earth has learned to do something else and it's gone through a kind of hysteresis where it's no, it'll never be the same again. Now what they're focusing on here are sort of in, in, um, in the biosphere, changing the, bio well this is the origin of life if you like, replicating molecules, this is prebiotic reproduction and then once that becomes encapsulated in a membrane, you start to get um, uh, these the sort of replicating um, autocatalytic collections of molecules which are starting to reproduce themselves and eventually can start to um, undergo natural selection, uh, producing chromosomes, RNA, and then this is, you know, eukaryotes, this is like uh, complex celled organisms like ourselves. Um, and then the rise of sexu sexual reproduction, the rise of um, multi-celled organisms, the rise of social colonies, and the rise of natural language, as it's called. There's some sort of shift happened when uh, humans and maybe a few other species developed this kind of capacity to symbolise in new kinds of ways. And maybe we could add some others down here as well um, about the origin of... Um, of uh, technology, new, new te uh, technologies, uh, but perhaps some other ones up here as well are more, more important before life started. So, you know, we can start to think about how um, these kind of major transitions in the earth produced, made it possible to have new forms of movement. So, for example, round about here was like about 500 million years ago when you start getting m complex multicellular organisms, animals, plants and fungi. You know, this is before then, uh, all living things basically drifted or sat still. You know, they didn't have a front or a back. Their body forms were very simple, and um, motion was basically either you know immobility or, um, or or drifting on currents and so on. So, what happens when um, these complex organisms start? That, well, one of the things that happens is you get crawling, you get swimming, you get the idea of uh, these, these forms of locomotion, uh, you start to get a proprioception, the idea that the, the, these animals have to have a, an, a, an internal image of where they are and where their body is organised and so on. Uh, so new forms of uh, movement start there. So um, I guess what I'm saying is, as I said before, I just uh, summarise, um, what I'm suggesting is, um, so... As we're, the, the, big, the bigger claim that this is a, part, a sort of a, a version of uh, is that um, uh, is this idea that uh, the nature of being as, as available to us as humans is radically conditioned by the uh, con contingent history of the Earth as a planetary body. Um, and I suppose what I'm saying is 
that when it comes to thinking about mobi the mobilities we have today um, that is theorized in the mo in mobility studies, um, if we uh, that we can by looking at how the earth has evolved these different forms of, uh, of movement within its complex um, uh, sort of articulated topologically complex body um, we can sort of better understand um, uh, what these forms of mobility are uh, yeah, see I told you I'd, I'd jump to a halt but that's, that was my attempt at summarising the abstract <laughs>